Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Photoshop Processing Tips and Tricks with Ross McKelvey. I am Trevor Pogson of the RPS Digital Imaging Committee. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all 280 of you. We're glad to see so many of you taking the time to be with us today. In addition to members of Digital Imaging, we have many Royal Photographic Society members and non-members from all over the world. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you so you'll know how to take part in today's event. For today's event, we have turned on closed captioning for the benefit of those people who need it. Uh, you can switch it on or off using the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen, unless you're using a tablet. If you are using a tablet, uh, would you please uh, message us using the Q&A icon and we'll send you the instruction. This Zoom event has a special question and answer feature. At the bottom of your screen, or possibly the top if you're using a tablet, you will see a Q&A icon. Uh, you can click on this to ask a question at any time during the presentation. At the end of Ross's presentation, there will be time for him to answer your questions. Now, his presentation is going to be so good that you will immediately want to thank him for it. But please don't. There will be an opportunity for your feedback after the event. So please, for today, questions only. Ross will answer as many of your questions as time permits. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Ross McKelvey. Ross holds many distinctions, including two fellowships and two master's qualifications, and has been awarded over 500 medals and too many less awards to even count in national and international salons and exhibitions since 2010. He was named number one in the world for large monochrome prints in the Photographic Society of America's Who's Who in Photography in both 2017 and 2018. A photo speed ambassador, Ross specializes in the print format, he is based in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Ross runs studio and fine art workshops in his commercial studio known as Catchlight Studio. As we hand over to Ross, I just want to remind you to use the Q&A feature to answer any questions, which will be answered after the presentation. So Ross, over to you. Thank you, Trevor, and thank you everybody for attending on this Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'm just gonna jump straight in. Uh, share my screen. Um, what I want to deal with first is some little um, sort of tips and tricks in terms of the way I set up my Photoshop. Uh, one of the first ones is brush size. So if I go into Photoshop preferences and down to cursors, by default, you will have what is called the normal brush tip. I prefer to use what is called the full size brush tip. And I also think it's a very good idea to have the crosshair showing in the center of the brush. You can just see it there as it's turned on. Now, what is the difference between the normal brush tip and the full size brush tip? I just want to show you, if I use um, a brush here, a hard edged brush, and go B naught, that means I'm painting at 100% opacity. And hopefully you can see the edges of the brush are just touching the edge of the, uh, the marching ants. So if I press that, the brush basically gives me, uh, it doesn't go outside the confines of my brush. Now, if I give myself the softest brush available and click it, maybe I'm gonna build it up maybe 20 clicks. Nothing I can do will cause the, uh, the paint to go outside the parameters of the brush and they will not go across or outside the parameters of the marching ants where I don't want the paint. If I change my um, brush to the normal brush tip and do exactly the same with the soft edged brush, so the edges of the brush are still touching the edges of the marching ants. Now you can see it will not go outside the marching ants. I actually need to deselect the, uh, the marching ants. I should have, I shall actually stroke them with a black uh, pen so you can see what's going to happen. So hopefully you can now see the stroke. Um, so if I now go with the soft edge brush, look what happens with the normal brush tip. I've been able to, to paint significantly outside the edge of my brush tip because it's amazing. A lot of people say to me, 
uh, oh, I don't know why, um, but I there's no way the edge of my brush went over the edge of the object, but it's still painted. And that is why, um, because you don't realize just how far the uh, soft brush, the normal brush extends outside the parameters of the actual brush itself. So if I change that back to my preferred method in preferences, cursors, and change it to the full size brush tip and do the exact same over here. I just physically cannot paint outside the edges of the brush. So that's a very good way to, uh, it's something that you, know, you might prefer the normal size brush, but you definitely need to be aware um, of just how far outside the actual edge of the brush it, it will paint. Uh, the other thing I do is on my curves. Hopefully the reason for this will become apparent. By default, your curves work in what's called light 0 to 255. And that means that you push the curve up to brighten and down to darken. I prefer to work the other way in what's called pigment ink percentage. Um, and that way, the curve is exactly the same. It just means that it's reversed. You pull down to brighten and up to darken. So if you see me doing that, you'll understand it's just a brightening curve or a darkening curve, but mine will work probably the opposite way um, to, to, to uh, how you're used to seeing it. The reason for that is that I like to be precise about the way I work. So rather than what I call wanging the slider up or down, I change the output in percentages. So uh, the dot is in the middle, 50, 50. And if I change that 50 to a 40, that is a 10% brightening so changing output 50 to output 40 is a 10 percent brightening rather than in the other way um just simply pushing it up uh, and having no idea where you're going to or coming from etc uh, let me just fix put that back to my pigmenting yeah it is my pigmenting percentage so the other thing i just want to show you very quickly is i am a big fan of nick software and I do change the way it works to suit me. So the way I work on it is I prefer to work on a duplicate layer. So Command or Control J gives me a duplicate layer. You can see over here now, there's a copy layer. And that is the layer that I want Nick software to work on. So if I go into Nick software, say ColorFX Pro, You go down to settings and look for this bar called after clicking OK. By default, it will say apply to a separate layer. And that means every time you run a filter in Nick software, it will apply it to a separate layer of its own making. It will apply a mask to that layer. It will then delete the mask. And, and it, I find that a lot of those things create problems with the way it works. So I always say, no, apply it to the current layer. You only need to do this once, and this will be remembered in the settings. So now whenever I play a filter in Nick software, it will be applied to the current layer, which of course is my duplicate layer that I bring in. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. So we have to do that for uh, Nick Silver FX, Nick Color FX, all the separate uh, Nick um, uh, filters that you use, but you just have to do it once and then I say it will remember it. Um, <clears throat> and actions, hopefully we can make the, I'm going to make a set of actions here. You can see I've called them RPS July 22. Um, hopefully we can get those sent out to you via the RPS. Um, I can probably even provide a link if I put them on to say Dropbox and people can download the set of actions. I put things in there already basic luminosity masks, convert to sRGB, which is something you often need, um, Velvia color boost action, which will hopefully demonstrate to you shortly. But something else that I do is a vignette action. Now, I'm going to show you how to build this, and this will be in the actions that hopefully we can forward to you. So new action, and we'll call it vignette. Hit the record button. 
select inverse, select modify feather, and I'm going to type in 400 pixels and hit OK. I'm going to go Command J to put that on a new layer, Command L to bring up levels. And instead of moving the sliders, I'm going to change 1.0 in the middle to 0.8, or I'll go to 0.75, make it a wee bit more uh, stronger. Click OK. And um, I am going to go V7. That changes the opacity of that to 70%. And I'm now going to say stop recording. All these actions now I can collapse. And there's my little action called vignette. If I just get rid of that, there's my vignette action. If I now just press play, oh, sorry. Um, I need to make a selection first. So if I make a selection, basically everything outside the selection that you make will now be vignetted if you play that action. So it's a nice soft vignette action. So it's working. And the other one I want to very quickly create is one that we will call, um, so new action, and we will call this dark details. Hit record, command J. So I'm including in the action to create a duplicate layer. And image adjustments, shadow highlights. Now shadow highlights is very extreme. So I'm just going to bring the sliders down. Click OK and apply a black mask and now stop recording. So the reason for this action will become um, apparent whenever I now start editing an image. So I'm just going to close that. I'm, I'm going to make one more action, which is my typical, um, I'll just open any old image here. Um, it's a, just a Brighton uh, action. So new action, Brighton, and we'll make it 15%, record. So command J for a duplicate layer, image adjustments, curves. And as I say, rather than wanging the slider, I'm gonna change the 50 to a 35. That is 15%. So that is brightening the image by 15%, changing the 50 output to 35, because we're working in percentages. And I'm now just going to apply a black mask by holding the Alt or Option key and hitting the mask to, and now stop recording. So this set of actions can be made available to you, hopefully, um, afterwards. And now we're just gonna start editing images and see some of these in action. So Lightroom, uh, we can start maybe with this one. This is a raw file of professional model Holly. Um, and I do not have a set routine whenever I am fixing images. I look at the image and I decide what needs to be done. So if I go into the develop mode, a little tip for you, I buy my mounts from a company called Paper Spectrum and they are 50 by 40 centimeters. So they're 50, standard 50 by 40 exhibition size mounts, but they come with a pre-cut uh, window uh, that is 36 centimeters by 26 centimeters. And that gives you an even seven centimeter border all around. And it means that you can use it for uprights and for landscapes because the border is, as I say, even all around. So whenever I'm cropping an image and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to be lazy and I'm going to use one of my pre-cut mounts, I have a little preset in here, three, 36 by 26 essentially. So I know if I print, if I crop it to this ratio and print it 36 centimeters on the long side, it will be 26 centimeters on the short side and it will be a perfect fit for my pre-cut mount. So there's a 36 by 26 ratio crop on this. Um, 
I click on the word shadows and I hit the plus key and they go up five at a time. And again, there's no magic number on this. It will depend on the image, how far you go. I think plus 40 is enough on that. Highlights, I'm gonna bring them down. Hitting the minus key, just looking at the image. And I might bring the contrast down slightly. Old and in the days gone by, film workers probably wanted a fairly flat, low contrast negative, and then they would introduce the, the, the contrast at the printing stage. And view your digital editing really um, along the same lines, and I think you'll get stronger digital images. So I'm basically creating um, the best negative that I can get here. Um, Color temperature looks pretty good, coming in at 5.2. I'll just raise it slightly, just warm it up slightly. And that is all I basically do in Lightroom. The crop, the highlights, the shadows, the color temperature. And I'm now going to send it into Photoshop. I don't know why I get that little message about updating because my settings are updated to the latest version of Camera Raw. Now let's look at this image and see what do we need to do. So first of all, how many of you have noticed there is a problem up here in the right hand corner? So there's a little dark triangle there uh, that needs to be fixed. The major problem for me with this is the brightness of this area of the breast here on this little bit of the shoulder. Um, so they are brighter than Holly's face. And you, you always want the, the face here to be uh, the brighter part. You don't want these areas to be brighter than her face. Otherwise, you're basically, you know, um, drawing the viewer's attention away from the face. So, and sometimes, of course, maybe that's what you want, but not in this case. We don't want these areas to be the brightest. Um, so we're going to deal with that. Now, uh, let's deal with this problem up here. First of all, um, a very simple way to fix something like that is just to make a duplicate layer. So Command J. Now, the reason for the duplicate layer is if I mess this up, I can just delete this layer and I've got the original underneath. Take the ordinary lasso tool and just select it like so. Shift backspace. Make sure that the contents are content aware and click OK. And another benefit of using my duplicate layer technique is I can turn it off and on to see where I started and where I've now got to. So that worked very well. Content aware fill, getting rid of that, I can now flatten image. Um, so dealing with the, uh, the bright areas, I have an action that uh, darkens, uh, but I'm gonna do this manually. Um, so. Command J, duplicate layer, image adjustments, curves. Now, the reason I like to do this with curves is there's a little hand tool here. If I click on this hand tool and then come over to the bright area on the, the image that I want to darken, as I move the mouse around, you can see it, it, it affects where it's affecting the curve, but I'm clicking on the area here on her chest that I want to darken. So I'm clicking there and I'm dragging down. Now I always go too far. And the reason I go too far is because I'm going to paint this in very softly and very subtly. So there is that. Obviously the whole image is darkened. And I now just black that out with a black mask. So underneath this black mask is that darkened image and it's been over darkened, but we don't care because we're just gonna paint it in at low opacity with a soft brush. So B for brush. Now, in terms of brush size and brush softness or hardness, I use the right square bracket key to make my brush bigger. And I use the left square bracket key to make my brush smaller. If I hold the shift key and hit the right square bracket key, I'm making the brush hard. If I hold the shift key and go left bracket, square brackets, I'm making it soft. And there are five increments. So I'm now, we can check it here. Hardness is at zero. 
If I go shift right square bracket key, it's now hardness 25. Shift right square bracket key, it's now 50. Shift right square bracket key, it's now 75. And last one, and it's now 100. You can see up here on the left, this hard edged white circle. That is an easy way to see where you are with it. But let's say you don't know where you are. I have no idea what the opacity of this brush is at the moment. I can see up here, it's not 100% hard, but if I want it to be the softest brush, I just go shift and hit left square bracket key about four times and I know I'm at zero. Uh, I don't need to go up there and check it. I know I'm at hardness to zero. So with a soft edged brush, I'm going to go B, um, B2, what does that mean I'm doing? I'm painting at 20% opacity. <clears throat> Up here, the opacity is 20%. I always get amazed when I see, you know, some high-end Photoshop workers on YouTube going up here and moving the slider and trying to get to a certain number or not caring what number they're at. If you want to paint at 20%, just hit two on your keyboard and you're automatically at 20%. So, Soft edged brush. I'm going to zoom in and I'm now just going to softly paint in over the areas that I think, and I'm clicking and rebrushing. So some areas are getting more than uh, a single pass at 20%. Some are getting just the 20%. Some are getting a bit more. Command zero makes the image fit the screen. So as I hit that before and after, you can see now as I turn it off and on, the effect of, of me painting uh, with that soft edged brush that was targeted. You're just simply using that little hand tool on the curves adjustment layer. So, we have got rid of the problem of the brightness of those bright areas of skin. Now, ideally, you should use a luminosity mask for that to target those areas of bright skin. I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna to keep this more, not necessarily basic level, but it's quite advanced when you start using uh, luminosity masks. So we might have a quick look if we have time, but I'm quite happy that with the way that I've been able to darken those areas. So I'm not going to flatten image and commit to that change. So let's use our action that we created at the start here, brighten 15%, and I just need to hit play. And automatically in a split second, I've got a duplicate layer hidden by a black mask, but look what's underneath. It has been brightened by 15%. And if I now go B2, I'm painting at 20%, and I'm going to brighten Holly's face. I've just gone B1, so I'm now painting a 10%, having already given it a 20% pass. So I'm just building that up. And look how subtle that is. Obviously, um, if this was pure white, it would be showing through 100%. Now, how am I showing you the mask? Alt or Option clicking on the mask shows you the mask. Turning it off and on shows me how much I've brightened her face. Am I happy with it? If I am, I'll just maybe look at softening. Now, I've painted this with a 0% hard brush. Um, I can't get any softer. So uh, I, I still think it's too severe, the transition from the dark area to the gray area. So I can, I can blur that, Gaussian blur. I'm gonna blur it by about maybe 75 pixels. There's the effect of the blur, and I'll maybe just blur it again. Now look how subtle that is. If I want it to be more visible, I can actually just go to image adjustments levels and just brighten that area. So the, the more I move this to the left, there is it 100% visible, but I can now basically play with the, the levels here to make that brighter, but still keeping that very soft edge. I'll go to there and let's have a look how beautifully soft 
that is in terms of brightening Holly's face, flatten image. The other action we made was the vignette action. Now, it's important to realize that you have to take the first step before you play the action. So you have to say, right, um, it's the area outside that selection that I want to be darkened, or you could use um, an elliptical marquee and say it's the area outside that that I want to be darkened. So I'm going to go with something like that. And I'm just going to hit my vignette, press play. And in a split second, there's the vignette. Now it's too much in this case, even though it's reduced to 70%, which is part of the action. But if I want to change that opacity 70%, I can just go V5 and I've reduced the opacity to 50%. Is that still too much? There's no right and no wrong here. I'm just teaching you the method and then different people will use it uh, in their own ways. But I'm gonna go three for 30%. And I think 30% is just about perfect on that for my taste. Flatten image. Now, um, there is an action that will be in this called Velvia Major Color Boost. I should actually put um big warning signs on it because trust me it is a major color boost so i'm just going to, i've done a duplicate layer command j for a duplicate layer and i'm going to play this major color boost so there you get it that's why i stress to you it is a major color boost uh, it comes with a white mask so i just hit command i which is invert and that inverts the mask to black but if I now go B2 or B3, I can subtly paint that in anywhere where I want to give them a color boost. Of course, I'm not going to go in at 100% because you know how mad, you know, there's how mad it's going to get. Just go B3 on that and give those strong um, pinks and oranges a color boost. Maybe a wee bit on her corset. So I'm basically selectively painting in this um, color boost. Off on, off on, happy with it. Flatten image. Now, um, there is a piece of software that you may not be aware of. It's in your paid version of Photoshop and it's in here under neural filters. And if you get a blue square over the face, that means that you can turn on skin smoothing. If you can't, if no blue box appears, then forget about it. Let me just close this door when the washing machine is spinning. So um, you have two, two um, choices on this blur, which is basically skin uh, texture, I suppose and smoothness, I'm just gonna leave that at default and I'm just gonna click okay. And it's actually pretty good. Command one to uh, get into 100%. If I turn it off and on, it just applies to the face. It doesn't apply to hair, it doesn't apply to any other parts of, of her body or skin. Um, now that's a bit much, but if I go V6, I'm allowing 60% of that inbuilt in Photoshop softening layer to, to and it's, I find it reasonably good uh, without having to, to uh, for people who do want to pay for a more professional um, uh, skin softening software. Um, <clears throat> now, let's give this the finishing touch. Uh, Command J, filter into Nick software, Color FX Pro. So remember, the way I've set up Nick software at the start, it's going to work on this layer. It's not going to create a duplicate layer. It's just going to create it on this layer in, in Photoshop. So I'm going to go to darken light and center. Now we have already darkened these areas that were too bright. We've brightened her face, but we want to take control over where the viewer is concentrated. And that we do that by what's called place center. So I'm just going to place the center up here near her face. 
I'm going to reduce the size of that center, typically 20 or less. I'll just go 20 on this. Border luminosity is basically darkening the edges of the image or everything outside that center. I'm going to bring that to about 30. And center luminosity is brightened by 25%. I'm just going to bring that back. Let's get rid of that um, to 20 or maybe go 18. So again, the beauty of the, this duplicate layer technique, I can show you before and after, before and after. So that little piece of software, next software, dark and light and center is now helping us through the use of basically brightness values to concentrate in on Holly's face. Flatten image. And um, let's just have a look at Holly's eyes. Little tip for you, if there is color in somebody's eyes, there is a tool in here with the dodge and burn tool called the sponge tool. You can set it to saturate colors or to desaturate colors. If there is color in the eye already, if you use it in saturate mode and paint over the iris, you can basically saturate the colors that are already there. Now I'm doing this on a duplicate layer, so I'm not worried about going too far. Why? Because if I do go too far, I can use opacity of that layer to uh, bring it back to more acceptable levels. And I'm just gonna dodge those highlights in her eye. Um, dodge tool set to work on highlights, 5%. Just using the left square bracket key to make it smaller. So, before, after, before, after, quite like that. So I'm going to keep the opacity quite high. I'll go V7, just take a third off. Happy with that, flatten image. Command zero, make it fit the screen. And if I now go file, save, it will now be saved as a TIFF file. And it will appear in Lightroom where we can show you the, um, I'll just go into develop and say reset. And I can now show you how quickly and simply we have been able to go from the raw file to the uh, finished article. Um, simple steps, nothing major needed to be done to the image. We have basically, reduce the brightness of these bright, bright areas. So they're no longer a distraction. We have brightened her face. We have brought out more color in the uh, material, etc. We've done a darkening vignette uh, around it. So all very simple, simple steps that basically will can help you transform an ordinary image into uh, something that uh, will hopefully do better for you in competition. Um, I want to show you this one. This is a professional English ballerina, Erica Mulcairn, taken in my studio. This was on one of my workshops. So these two people are attendees on the workshop and what they were basically doing at this was, uh, as, as Erica jumps, the dress comes down. So they were basically helping the dress to, to come up with her. And all I was worried about was trying to catch the model against the background. So I wanted separation between her hands um, and, the, uh, and the, the dress. And I want to show you how, how wonderful Photoshop can be. Um, I'm just going to crop in to the background. I'm going to try and basically save as much of the actual background as I can. So we'll fix this hand, highlights, click on highlights and use the minus key to bring the brightness of highlights down. Shadows, we go the opposite way. If I go shift plus, it goes up 20 at a time. So if you think you have a lot of shadow detail to bring up rather than pressing up five at a time, you can hold the shift key and go up 20 at a time. 
Um, I've settled on about 60 there. I'll just hit blacks and give it one press to go up plus five in blacks. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at this image. What else do we need? think needs done? So applying the same principles, look at the brightness of this part of her hand and wrist and here along the upper arm, and maybe the brightness of the foot. Do you want those to be the brightest areas? I would have thought not. Um, so let's just bring this into Photoshop 2022. So let's fix the hand first. Now, once you, you have put content aware into the box for the selection, all I have to do, I'm just going to command J for duplicate layer, take the lasso tool, and roughly draw around it. I know that content aware is in the, the box. So if I go shift backspace, enter, it's gone. How long was that? Three seconds, two seconds. So let's just show you that again in slow motion. So we just simply command J for a duplicate layer, a rough selection using the lasso tool, shift Backspace is the shortcut for the fill menu. I knew the content aware fill was already in there from the last time I used it. So I could just go basically shift backspace, enter, and the hand was gone. So um, let's say you wanted a wee bit more space here on the right hand side. Let me just move this. Um, bar here. So on the crop tool, I'm just going to crop this how I like to see, uh, just doing it by eye. So I'm basically adding on extra space here on the edge of this image. And as long as I make sure that this little box is ticked content aware, watch what happens when I commit to that crop. So it's going to crop and then it's going to fill it with content aware. So we've basically extended the background. Photoshop has been clever enough to um, uh, add on bits of background without adding on bits of her skirt. If her skirt was actually touching the background, then you would have to use a slightly different method, but I will not deal with that uh, today. Um, so let's deal with the brightness of these highlights on her arms. Uh, Command J, image adjustments, curves. This time I will just very quickly demonstrate the use of luminosity masks. Um, they're not essential, but you will get a much more professional result. So I'm clicking on the bright area of her arm here, and I'm dragging down. Why is that not working? Try that again, image adjustments, curves, click on the hand tool, click on the bright part of her arm and drag down. And there we go, it's being darkened. And as I say, do go too far because you're gonna paint it in at low opacity with a soft edge brush. So there is the whole image darkened, targeted obviously using that curves hand thing due to the brightest part of her, her arm. So as I say, I'm going to use luminosity masks to target that bright part of her arm. Uh, I tend to use a, a plugin called Lumenzia, but let's just do it um, manually uh, with a set of actions that I can have sent to you. This is create all masks. This is basically going to create all sorts of luminosity masks. So in the channels, this will give me something like 18 uh, masks, and I'm now going to look for a mask that select that targets the bright part of her arm. It looks as if lights two is the best. So if I command click on on that, I've basically made a selection. I'm going to hit command H to hide the marching ants, but I've I've selected uh, the bright parts of the image. And if I go B. Three, I'm painting at 30% opacity, and I don't need to be careful about where I'm brushing because I have got a selection that has targeted the bright parts of her 
um, well, not just parts of her arm, but anything um, bright has been selected, anything dark or a mid-tone is not. So I can come down. I don't need to worry about where I'm painting because those parts have been targeted using the luminosity mask. If I show you the mask that I've just painted, this looks, well, it is, I suppose, the image, but it's that is a mask. This is just black and white, but it's the selection that makes it uh, look, uh, you know, how it does. So look how subtly and targeted I've been able to uh, reduce those bright parts of her arm using the luminosity uh, mask method. If I just delete that, I can show you the simple way to do it without using the luminosity masks. If you're not um, familiar with luminosity masks or prefer for whatever reason not to use them. Having done that, this is quite a clever little trick for people who don't want to use luminosity masks. So I just want to paint on her arm. The way you would have done it before is B3 say, and you'd have used a soft edge brush and you'd been trying to make very sure that your brush didn't go outside the edges of her arm and you're gonna paint that in and it gets very difficult just not to go, oops, outside her arm and all of a sudden you get halos and all sorts of problems. Um, but here is a very clever little tip. Click on the image. So I'm not on the mask, I'm on the image. And I come over here to the object selection tool and I just basically draw um, a rectangle around her arm and it knows what I'm trying to select. And I can add on further here. So look at that for a fantastic selection of her whole arm. Now, the benefit of the luminosity mask approach is that the luminosity mask will ignore these dark areas of her arm. We now basically have a selection of the whole of her arm. B2 will allow me to paint this in at 20% opacity. And I'm just trying to concentrate on the darker, or sorry, on the brighter parts of her arm, ignoring the shadow parts of her arm. But it means that I, with this selection made, I don't need to use a luminosity mask and I don't need to worry about painting on the background because it's not selected. And look how simple that is. So having done that, let's come down to her foot. If you try and draw a box around her foot, no, nothing will happen. Well, in fact, that's amazing. It did happen. I'm on the mask, so I wasn't expecting that to happen. I didn't think that Photoshop would be able to select the foot because it's I'm on the black mask. You probably get a better result if you do click on the image itself and draw out your selection tool. And now I can click back on the mask, B2, and very subtly and very softly paint in that darkening curved layer. Command D to deselect. Whoops, Command zero to make it fit the screen. Turn it off and on. So if you look at her arm and her foot, they have been darkened without creating any halos on the background or without affecting the brightness or darkness of the background. Happy with it? Flatten image. Let's go over to our Oh, by the way, if you do play that create all masks action, you all those 18 channels will remain there until or unless you play delete all masks. So remember to do that. Remember, if you do play create all masks, remember to delete them all at the end. Uh, so let's brighten her face using this brighten 15% action that we created. Split second there. Let's see the before and the after. Again, I'm just going to undo that and show you likewise how you can use this um, selection tool to basically see if it's clever enough just to select her head and face. Yeah, look at that. So B2, painting in 20% opacity. So I'm not going to be brightening the skirt or the edges of the background. This selection has basically allowed me just to target her face 
Command D to deselect, and now look how perfect that is in terms of brightening her face. Happy with it? Flatten image. Let's do our, and just to teach you how, how versatile this vignette action is, you don't actually have to do a um, rectangular selection, which is your traditional vignette. You can basically come in and select very roughly. So remember everything outside the selection that you make will be darkened. So rather than having a rectangular traditional or uh, elliptical uh, traditional vignette, I'm just going to create a willy nilly vignette, I suppose. Press play. V4, 40%. If you're happy with it, flatten image. Now, again, just to show you how versatile that action is, let's say I wanted to darken this area here. Very simple way to do is you think, right, where's the area I want to darken? I want to darken this area here. Remember, it's the area outside the selection that gets darkened. So I need to invert my selection. So if I now play the action, this area in here will be very subtly and very softly vignetted or well, not vignetted, darkened. Ignore the warning. It's basically telling me that there's a very soft selection in place. Look how subtle that is, darkening that area. Before, after, before, after. Flatten image. Um, the shape of the skirt, once it's just material, I've just gone Command J for a duplicate layer. Um, you can go into Liquify. And up to this first tool called the Forward Warp Tool. And you can basically shape that material. I don't particularly like shaping female bodies or male bodies or whatever. Um, sometimes it can help just to tweak somebody's uh, um, shape, but by and large, I don't care whatsoever about material. It's just material. Um, so again, the advantage of the duplicate layer you can see where you start and where you've, you've, you've ended up. If you're happy with it, flatten image. Let's do, even though we've done a darkening vignette, let's do a traditional vignette. I'm gonna do a narrow, draw out a narrow selection here. Press play. V5, just reduce that to 50% maybe. Latin image. Now I did show you an action that I created at the start called dark details. I didn't explain what it would be used for, but hopefully the clue is in the name dark details. So we're going to try and use this action to give details in her dark, dark hair. Press play. In a split second, we've got that amount of detail brought out. Far too much, but as I say, I, this is the approach I like, making your duplicate layer go much further than you want or need, and then painting it in with low opacity. So we'd, we just want to paint in over her hair. Now this again is where you would get a problem if you're gonna go say B5 for 50%. And if your brush goes over the edge of her hair, look what happens, the dreaded giveaway signs that any judge will, fault, will spot. So again, let's see if this new tool, object selection, can realize that we're just gonna try and select her hair. So it selected her face, but does that matter? It doesn't matter as long as I don't paint over her face, but I've got a perfect selection of her dark hair against the background, and that's all I want. B3 maybe, soft edged brush.
look, look, so there's the dark detail action, bringing out that detail in her hair. We see it at normal size before and after. Flatten image. Remember our um, command J, Nick software, Color FX Pro. Dark and light and center. Over towards the face. Make that 20 or less. We'll go 16 or 17. Border luminosity, how dark do you want it? We'll keep it fairly high at minus. When I say high, it's at a minus value. So I should, I should really be calling it a low value, but it's, if you know what I mean, minus 40. Just bring that back a little. Click OK. So this is dark and light and center. That's too much. V67. Now, why V67? That takes 33% off, exactly a third. So I'm allowing two thirds of that to come through. I think that's okay for my taste, flatten image. So uh, we have re removed the problem of these bright highlights on her arm and wrist, drawing attention away from her face. We have brightened her face. We have used dark and light and center to bring you into her face. We've made the background nice and dark, etc. Uh, we've reshaped the skirt, all very simple steps that basically enhance the image. Now, one thing I haven't talked about is sharpening. Um, there are so many different ways to sharpen. Let's just show you a couple. Um, I do like this one with Nick software, filter Nick software, output sharpener. By default, it sharpens for display and it's too severe. I always sharpen for print inkjet. Auto, I always take that to luster. Now, this is just a sharpening technique. I'm not actually printing this image and it doesn't matter what paper I'm printing it on. I'm just trying to find settings in here that I like. I change the printer resolution to 2400 by 2400 and I basically don't hit anything else. Um, now, this was a 50 million pixel camera. Um, this works perfectly. If you go inkjet auto luster 2400 by 2400 and just click OK, for a typical 24 to 30 million pixel camera, it does work beautifully. I have found it doesn't work as well on the sort of medium format 50 million pixel cameras. Um, let's just no. So command one brings me into 100%. Is it too much at those settings? Yes, it is. But if I go say V6, yeah, you can see, I mean, this is a raw file. Raw files do need to be sharpened. Uh, and that absolutely does need to be sharpened there. Um, probably 50% might be uh, better. There we go, 50%, I think. Well, in fact, I'm not flattening the image. I'll just leave that off. Another way to sharpen is filter sharpen, smart sharpen. I quite like smart sharpen once I realized that it was a bit aggressive on my medium format uh, or that I realized that the Nick sharpener was a wee bit aggressive on my large uh, megapixel images. So normally I would advise don't allow the radius to go above one pixel. I think by default, it might be set to 1.2, um, but bring it down to less than a pixel, 0 0.8 or 0 0.7. Um, and then the amount you can be um, quite high with, you know, 120 typically. So those are my typical settings for a large file, 120, 0 0.7, and click OK. Command 1, turn that off and on. And let's see the other one. So the other one is far more aggressive. Um, and the final one I'll show you is the um, high pass technique. So filter high pass, and it looks as if three pixels. If you see haloing like this, 
in your uh, radius settings, you know it's going to be too much. So I'm going to bring that down to two pixels. Excuse me, one pixel. Will it allow me to go 1.5 pixels? So this may not be the best method for this. You basically then change that layer into overlay or soft light, depending. Overlay is more aggressive. Soft light is less aggressive. Command one, we'll just zoom in a little more to see if we have got a problem where the halos appeared or not. No, that's okay. That type of sharpening, that, um, uh, what do you call it, high pass, will not affect the sharpening of the background the, the, on this part of the dress. Anywhere it sees an edge or a crease or a line, it will be sharpened. Uh, that's the benefit of it. Um, but any of those three techniques, you know, play with, find one that you like, and then maybe make an action out of it uh, is the best way to, uh, to, you know, make actions for things that you use regularly and constantly, um, and your workflow will improve significantly. Um, let's just get rid of that one. I'm just going to flatten this. Flatten image. And again, just to show you, Command-J, this Velvia Mad Color Boost. Command-I. And let's just use this selection to see if it will select the dress and the model. Yes, it will. B2, paint that strong color boost in at 20%. Maybe not everywhere. I don't want to paint it in over skin tone, obviously. So if I show you the before and the after, just give them a kick to those reds. Is that too much? If it is, V7, take a third off. If you felt that that red satin type material, so that's part of the inner lining of the skirt, if you thought that that was um, too bright, you could use the um, opposite of the saturation brush. You're going to use it in desaturate mode. You're taking the color out of it. I'm not sure that I actually would do that, but um, that's just to show you that that type of tool is available to you if you've never seen it or used it before. So again, if I hit File, Save, that is now an Edit TIFF file back in Lightroom. And when I go back into Lightroom, there it is, the edit TIFF file, and we can compare that to our original So here's your raw file, and we've been able to very quickly and very easily get to that um, using hopefully simple techniques that uh, uh, you now can start playing with. So um, that is our R up. I, I think we can now take uh, questions. Well, that's great. That was uh, really interesting, Ross. So thank you for that. Um, you can turn off your screen share now, which you've done, which is brilliant. Now is the time for you to ask questions. We do have one to start with, so I'll come to that in a minute. Um, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen or possibly the top if you're using a tablet to send questions to us. Um, so if you do want to comment on today's event or send your thanks, please could you save that for the survey? We'll send you in a few days for today questions only, but we will be sending you uh, information in the follow-up email on how to get those actions from Ross that will come through in the same email that we send the questionnaire with. So do keep an eye out for that. So first question from Sandy. Uh, they say, why do you flatten image after each action? Because basically I am committing to the changes I have made. 
I am, as you saw, my technique is to put on a black mask and then typically just paint a, a holes in that black mask where I want to bring in the effect of that layer. So if I then want to work on a, um, on a layer that has those committed to, I would need to create what's called a stamp visible layer. Um, it's just simple. If you do it correct and do it right and you're happy with it, just flatten the image. There's no benefit to me in keeping those extra layers. I would probably end up with about 20 layers on each image. So um, by just simply committing to whatever I've done, whatever that change may be, I'm quite happy to be able to say, yeah, I've done that, I've done it right. I can't do it any better. I'm happy with it, flatten image. And if I mess it up, as I say, the advantage of that duplicate layer is that I can just delete that layer um, and do another duplicate layer and start that uh, again. But there's no benefit to me in keeping those uh, separate layers if I'm just, you know, brightening something or darkening something. Okay, thanks for that. Question from Dennis. Uh, you seem to prefer TIFF over PSD. Why is this? I typically um, only use PSD whenever I uh, have layers in an image. Um, obviously, the only type of image that I would have layers in is a composite, where I've cut something out and used something else from another image. So if I'm saving an image that does have layers in it, I will use PSD. Uh, but I don't think there's any technical difference between a TIFF file and a PSD file. They are both um, supposedly uh, lossless. A JPEG, as you open and close a JPEG over time, it will deteriorate. But TIFF files and PSD, I don't think there's any real difference between the two. So it's just a matter of pure personal preference. Okay. Um, what was the question, but it's just been answered. Oh, yeah. Question from Kirsten. Uh, could you remind us of the name of the mount board company, please? Paper Spectrum. Um, they will sell you a pack of five, 50 by 40 um, uh, pre-cut mounts. You can buy them with a square mount. Uh, which is our square aperture rather, which is 28 centimeters square. Um, and you can buy the typical three by two aperture, which is 39 by 26. But obviously that has to be used for a landscape. Um, you couldn't use that for an upright because it's not an even border. And that's why, as I say, I love the 36 by 26, because if I buy, say, five packs of them, it doesn't matter whether I'm printing a landscape or a portrait. Um, I know that I will have an even, by, or even border all around. I can use it either way. I actually have a discount code um, that I can uh, give people if I can just put my hand on it in a second. Oh, we can add that to the uh, follow-up yeah. email if you like. Okay. Send it across to Deborah. She'll uh, yeah. follow up email, Ross. Thanks for that. So that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here about Photoshop. The Photoshop RAW filter um, has also given the option for noise reduction and sharpening. How effective are they? Um, I think, like most things in Photoshop, they have gradually improved. Originally, the uh, noise reduction wasn't great, but uh, I do tend to use, I think it's a Topaz filter for noise reduction. Um, but I haven't compared it with the Photoshop, but I would say that the, the, the Photoshop noise reduction is certainly much better than it was. So if you were put off using it whenever it first appeared, um, you maybe go back and have another look at it because Photoshop is constantly evolving and they don't tell you that they've changed something. You know, you just maybe open it up after an update and there'll be new tools or new um, features in there or things will work differently to how they did before. But yeah, um, have a look and see. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, this time from uh, Rosemary. Ross, you used to use detail extractor in Nick to dodge and burn. Do you still use it? I do. I think detail extractor is one of my most used uh, filters in Nick software. Um, a tip for you is by default, it is quite it gives you sort of a HDR type appearance. It's in other words, it's too aggressive. If you move the contrast slider, I think by default, the contrast is set to 6%. If you raise it to typically around 30%, it takes on a much more natural appearance. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, the, it still brings out that shadow detail and also you know brings back a wee bit of detail in the highlights sort of it works at both ends if you like it brings detail out of shadows but it also adds more detail to bright areas unless they're blown out of course where it will have no effect whatsoever but yeah just um, raise the contrast slider for a slightly more natural look uh, and then just paint it in uh, wherever you need it yeah, that's great. A couple of questions here about layers from Sheila. The first one is, what about keeping all the layers visible for competition? Um, I'm not sure what she means by that. Does she mean yeah. in, order, in order to be able to um, prove that everything was your own or something, that, or everything that you've used in an image is... Uh, Perhaps, Sheila, um, if you could maybe type a follow-up question on that to maybe um, explain in more detail what you're after, then uh, Ross can give you an answer to that. So if you wouldn't mind perhaps sending a bit more, uh, a bit more detailed question, that'd be fantastic, please. And a question from David, again about layers. Uh, he says, you flatten your images to commit each stage. Is this good practice for someone relatively new to Photoshop? Um, <laughs> That's a tricky one because there will be also there, there will be so many levels of, of uh, ability involved. But put it like this, um, I think, and I'm going to put my own hands up here too. Every time we, uh, the first time you learn how to brighten eyes, for instance, you'll go too far. The first time that you do skin softening, you'll go too far, and then you suddenly realise less is more. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen images where people were brightening people's teeth so that they were pure white and uh, eyes were basically jumping off the page. Um, and I always think it's good to see, in other words, people have realised how to do something and all they now need to be taught is how to rein it back in and make it look more realistic. So um, all I suppose I would say is... Um, uh, Try the technique, see how you get on with it. See if you have any advantage yourself in keeping the layers. One advantage maybe of keeping the layers is, is that you can go back and reduce the opacity of a layer if you have gone too far. But I'm quite happy that I've sort of learned the lessons about going too far. Um, but yeah, I suppose that, would, that could be an advantage for somebody starting out just to keep it and then you can go back and, and once you realize, oh my goodness, look what I did yesterday. I must have been on the alcohol uh, and you realize that less is more. Uh, you do have then the ability rather than starting again, just to reduce the opacity of that layer and, and, and make it less glaring. And out of interest, Ross, would it be a good idea to rename the layers so you know which, what each one does? Yeah, I always advocate that. Um, always type in what a layer is. You know, you can just type in detail extractor or you can write curves or eyes brighten, whatever it is, it's a very, very good idea to type it in. Um, if you're, no point if you're gonna you know, flatten it at the end, but um, if you are gonna keep them as layers, then yeah, always a good idea to, to type in um, what, what they are. Okay, and Sheila's come through with a follow-up question or and she's in, enhanced the detail of her question. Uh, she said, it's in case the competition organizers want to verify it's all your own work. She says she's prefers to flatten her images, but she's been told to keep all the layers in place. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that approach. I certainly would not be hogging my hard drives with images with loads of layers just to satisfy um, some competition organizer that um, uh, I complied with all the rules. If they, you know, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy with my own integrity to follow the rules, but if somebody does come back and question, I, I would be quite happy to send whatever I've used in an image and say, yeah, I use this, I use this, I use that. Um, but um, I'm certainly not going to bend over backwards um, for, for somebody to come saying, oh, can you prove to me that you didn't uh, uh, break a rule there? I don't advocate in any way breaking rules, but um, I certainly do my damnedest to stay within the rules. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to go uh, and, and create bigger files with lots of layers just in case somebody comes back and says, oh, can you prove to me that that was all your own work? I'm quite happy I can send them whatever proof they need um, in other ways. Okay, uh, another question here. Are you working with 16-bit or 8-bit? 16 every time. Uh, very important to use the 16-bit because 
all the changes that I'm making in these layers, you know, making curves adjustments and bringing out more detail, um, even the sharpening, etc. cetera, um, you will get um, digital artifacts much, much more uh, apparent with an 8-bit file as opposed to 16-bit. So always work on 16-bit. Okay. A uh, question from Clive. Uh, this is Ross. You mentioned the mountain company that you used, but do you recommend any paper suppliers? Photospeed, obviously, <laughs> uh, as I'm sponsored by Photospeed. Um, they, again, I can give you a discount code for Photospeed paper. Um, the, my go-to paper is a, is a PF Luster. It's quite a reasonably priced paper, PF Luster 275. Um, but I do have a favourite, which is the, um, the, the Barita paper, uh, particularly for black and white. Um, but yeah, there's a whole range of, of photo speed papers, um, obviously in the fine art papers as well. Some people are, have an idea that, oh, this will look great on a fine art paper, when in fact, the image is in no way suitable for fine art paper. Uh, the image needs to be a sort of a fine art image. It needs to be slightly more high key, probably, to be on uh, fine art paper. Um, so, you know, fine art paper is not a magic tool to use for um, for for a good print. Some papers will will be or some prints will be far far better uh, on an ordinary luster or uh, pearl type uh, paper. Okay. Again, if you could let us have that discount code, we'll include it in the follow up email, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A uh, question from Thomas. As you sharpen the image during editing, do you use the sharpen again in the Lightroom print module? No, um, I don't print from Lightroom. Um, I have never um, printed from Lightroom, so unfortunately I can be of no assistance. Uh, I print from Photoshop. Right. Uh, and a question from David, and this is one actually I've been wondering about. Is the NIC 5 suite significantly bet better than the version 4, i.e. the new upgrade? Um, I wonder what version mine is. Uh, I think just... it said four when you when you called it up. Right. Um, certainly this one was, uh, I paid for it oh, maybe within the last couple of years. Uh, and it has been updated a couple of times. I did get, uh, as you maybe saw during the presentation, something came up about the uh, update on, um, uh, that a, a software update is available. But it's, uh, from what I've seen, this is this new five one that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that there's an awful lot new in it, to be honest. Um, unless somebody can show me that there's something in there worth paying for, I'm quite happy to continue using the one I have, put it like that. And I do use it regularly. I love it. I think the thing I had to is that it's sixty nine pounds to upgrade if you've got a, if you've got version four or something. So yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for that. Okay, next we have a question from John. Uh, Ross, do you ever vary flow when you're using a brush? Yes. Um, so I told you I use the number keyboard for opacity. If you want to vary the flow, you just simply hold the shift key. So if I want to reduce the flow from 100% down to, say, 30%, I just go shift three. And that is a very simple, very easy, quick way to, to, to adjust the flow. Um, so yeah, you can play with with opacity and with flow, and I, I do I do that regularly. So shift uh, number will give you the flow, and just a number on its own will give you the opacity. Great, thank you. A question from Richard. He says a beginner's question: uh, When you've created a duplicate image to work on, what's the point of creating a black mask? Is it to easily see what you have changed? The black mask is to basically black it out. So if it has a black mask that layer is not visible and whatever is on that layer will only become visible once I paint um, with either a dark um, at, a, at a low opacity or a high opacity a hole in that mask so the, the purpose of the black mask is to black out um, whatever I have whatever change I have done so you may have remember I said several times I'm going too far here you know darkening the arm I went too far on the curves adjustment. You know, I went really extreme, but I then black that out with the black mask. And then I just paint in at say 20% opacity, um, making it nice and subtle. Um, whereas if you only went as far as you needed with the initial curves adjustment, then you have to be painting at 100% for it to work. Hopefully that makes sense. 
A uh, question from Lee uh, about gear. Uh, Ross, can we please have a brief update on your preferred camera and lenses for your studio work? A Canon 5D Mark IV or a Canon mirrorless now? You mentioned 50 megapixels. I mean, there's no doubt that mirrorless is the future. Um, Canon have actually said that the latest digital SLR they have, whatever it is, is their last. They will not be upgrading uh, digital SLRs anymore. There'll be no new digital SLR models. So mirrorless is the future. Um, and I am a mirrorless convert. And I can tell you it is absolutely amazing brackets when it works, when it does what it's supposed to. But I will warn you, uh, switching to mirrorless is a fairly steep learning curve. Your camera will now basically become a computer. It is definitely more like a computer than a, than a, a traditional camera. There are pages and pages and pages of menus in there. There are all sorts of things you need to change if you're using it outdoors or indoors for studio work, etc. Um, and I, I'm now probably going to start insisting that people who come on my workshops with a mirrorless camera know how to use it uh, before they come because the, the number of problems that you can have, you know, for instance, if you have silent shutter, you know, for a wedding photographer, silent shutter is brilliant. The vicar is not going to be shouting at you anymore. But if you try and fire flash in the studio with silent shutter on, it's not going to fire the flash and you need to be in mechanical shutter rather than electronic shutter to fire the flash. So they're all, and you need to have live view off in the studio, etc. And then you go outside and you suddenly forget that you've made all those changes and tweaks and your camera's now not working as you want it to when you go outside, etc. So mirrorless is definitely the future. I focus, animal focus, bird focus. These things really do work. I have seen them in action and used them myself. They are quite remarkable. And that, as I say, is why camera manufacturers know uh, there's no going back from this. Mirrorless is the future. Yes, I agree with what you say there. I know one of the latest Nikon mirrorless cameras, the manual's over 900 pages. <laughs> and they don't give you a copy in the box. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It is a steep learning curve, but well worth it. Um, there, a question from Dennis. Have you ever tried Topaz Sharpen AI versus Nick? No, a uh, simple answer, no, I haven't. Okay, uh, during resize, which mode of resample is recommended? Um, I, let me just check that with, um, I'll just open something and image, image size. Um, I just simply use automatic. Um, I never uh, increase the size of an image. I'm only ever decreasing the size of an image. Um, so in other words, sometimes people will tell you that your PPI should be exactly 300 pixels per inch when you're printing an image. And if, if it's not, they will add, you know, get Photoshop to add pixels to get to that 300 magic figure. You are far better leaving your image alone and printing at a lesser PPI um, rather than increasing pixels. You know, you, you do not want Photoshop going in there, adding pixels, uh, stick with the image that you have. So um, I only ever resize an image and that is whatever I'm changing from say a print image to a PDI where you have to have it by say 1600 by 1200 pixels or something like that. Um, and I just simply use the automatic uh, in the resampling. Okay, question from John. Uh, Ross, this is about your luminosity masking. John, uh, Ross, you had a, a plugin in top, on your top right called Luminosity. You can't remember what it actually was. How does that compare to Nick's software in terms of ease of use? What was the software you used for your luminosity masks? Lumenzia. Lumenzia. So how so, does that compare to Nick's software in terms of ease of use? Uh, Nick's software doesn't have luminosity masks, so... Uh, it, what the Lumenzia panel does is um, it, it's not really comparable to Nick software. Uh, the Lumenzia is purely for um, uh, lum luminosity mask work. Uh, it is fairly good. It's run by a guy called Gregory Benz, mm. and um, he has lots of tutorials available. And in fact, on the it's not that expensive either. It's maybe from memory 30, 40 pounds. Uh, but what it does is is really quite remarkable. Um, 
maybe on my YouTube channel if you want to check out uh, one of my videos on luminosity. I think there will you might see me demonstrating uh, the Lumenzia panel in action. But Gregory Baines has his own channel on YouTube, um, and uh, yeah, Lumenzia is definitely worth getting to grips with. But don't expect to do it overnight. Uh, it is a learning curve. Uh a question sort of comment from Janet on the business about keeping layers and maybe you, you could comment on this she she says that she assumed that keeping all the layers was more to do when you're creating a composite image maybe for a competition where composites used yeah I, that's the only time I really have uh, layers because if I cut something out I'm going to first of all try and cut it out perfectly and to cut out it cut it out perfectly it takes time and effort um, and I'm only I only ever want to do that once so I'm not going to flatten that image and then decide that it would work better with a different background a week later and have to go back and cut it out again. So that is why I will keep that, that type of composite image as a layered uh, PSD file so that at any stage I always have that, whatever it is, uh, cut out on a, on a separate layer and available for use in another image. And I guess that also would apply to the fact if you get asked to prove it's all your own work if you if you produce a composite image to a competition you can still show all those layers yeah they were your pictures and what you've done yeah and even as i say even if if, if i hadn't uh saved it as layers obviously if i've used a sky um as a background or used whatever um a pipe in somebody's mouth or whatever if i have that photograph of the pipe that i used i can just simply say here are the five images that i cut out and used for that image but yeah obviously the the layered psd file uh, makes it simple a uh, question from Carolyn: uh, can you use liquify with 16-bit images yep that's what i just demonstrated yeah they were 16-bit and i was using liquify Okay, question from Eamon. Uh, how do you ensure that your image prints as brightly as your on-screen image? Do you use levels at all? So on my Mac, I think there are something like 20 levels of brightness. I am working at brightness level four. So right down to the bottom level, and then I go one, two, three, four um, to work at brightness level four. And that is what I have found matches as close as you can the luminosity of my prints. The, the, um, the, you'll never get them absolutely uh, perfect because obviously all our screens nowadays are backlit sort of LCD type screens. Uh, so they'll always have that sort of punch uh, and brightness that, that you'll find very, very hard to replicate on a print. But yeah, in terms of brightness values, people tend to have their brightness turned up too high on their screens. And then for instance, if you use a third party uh, to print your image, you're actually sending off an image that in reality is darker than you think it is. And that's why your prints come back dark. Um, they have to apply, um, but I do have an action um, that makes a very subtle um, increase in the midtones. Uh, it, you saw how I, I use that uh, reverse curve. I think it's a, a seven or eight percent brightening um, in the middle of the curve. And I just play that action uh, and then print. And it's basically just a very, very subtle increase in the brightness of, of my image before I, I print it. But I am, I have, I am touch wood. What I see on my screen is more or less exactly what prints out. Okay. Um, comment from Catherine on Nick Five. Apparently, it still has quite a lot of bugs, so she's told. Uh, so fair enough. Yeah. Um, the, well, one thing I will say out of that is that's typical for all sorts of things. You know, let's say Mike, Microsoft or Apple bring out a new operating system. Do not change. Do not be one of the early converters. Let other people uh, install it first and see what problems they have. Uh, I know I would wait about six months before you install anything new. Uh, question from John. With the new mask facilities in Lightroom, are you ever tempted to use them for selective changes rather than going into Photoshop? I don't edit in Photoshop, so I basically just do, you know, colour temperature, cropping, uh, highlights and shadows, etc. But yeah, I have toyed with and played with the new masking tools in Lightroom. And I've also seen a couple of videos on YouTube and they are 
amazing because not only do they have a fantastic inbuilt masking technique, but they actually now also incorporate luminosity masks as well. So you can target uh, areas not based not just on selections, but on their brightness. So yeah, for, for those who use Lightroom, it is a very different tool now from what it used to be. Yeah, we've just got a couple of questions left. So we go, okay, on time for you? Yeah. Yeah, grand. Uh, question from Mary. Uh, can I ask what mirrorless camera you use? I have two. I have a Fuji medium format GFX and I have a Sony uh, A1. Okay, and last question is, are you using the fringe tool in RAW? Oh, one more turn now. The fringe tool in RAW. No, I don't use it. Um, um, I remember having a look at it one time, but no, I don't. I'm not overly uh, familiar with the the uh, fringe tool. Um, um, what was the last question? Sorry, there was something I wanted to add. Uh, it was I. Uh, what about the camera? Yeah. Oh yeah, what um, camera do you use? Yeah. I was always a Canon user, and. Um, I will say this, um, although I converted from Canon to Sony and, and Fuji, the only reason I did so was because Canon was too slow to recognize how far the mirrorless revolution had, had gone. But once they did realize it, you know, people come into my studio with the R5 and the R whatever they are, and they are absolutely fantastic, uh, as are the Nikon mirrorless. So, um all the cameras now all the manufacturers with their mirrorless cameras they are all absolutely fantastic so if you do have canon glass definitely don't think about switching to sony or nikon or any you know keep the if you've got quality glass trust me no matter what manufacturer uh, or brand they are their mirrorless camera will do a super job for you so stick with the glass you have and the brand that you're familiar with I would have stuck with Canon if they had come out with their mirrorless cameras um, in time. Yeah, I'd second that. I, I've done the same thing. I agree. It's uh, the mirrorless cameras are amazing. Uh, great. Oh, a comment really from uh, Godfrey is did a Nick course yesterday. Nick and Apple seems to be okay, but those with Windows have had big problems. So maybe at the moment, the whole file on Nick 5, if you're a Windows, <laughs> would seem to be the message. But there you go. Um, question from Richard. How do I set Photoshop to operate in 16-bit? The image seems to open in 8-bit automatically. Um, I do it from initially from Lightroom. So in Lightroom preferences, um, you have the choice under um, external editing to choose 16-bit. So once I send my images, which are raw files from, um, from Lightroom into Photoshop, they are coming in uh, automatically because of my Lightroom settings as 16-bit files in ProPhoto RGB color space. Um, I don't know why an image would be 8-bit uh, in, let me just see in settings here a second in Photoshop. Um, preferences general. I don't know why it would be um, eight bit in in Photoshop, but I say I'm I'm typically just coming in from Lightroom, so I am actually ensuring with my Lightroom settings that it's coming in as a sixteen bit file, and even even the masks that I use. Um, are 16-bit masks, and that is through the Lumenzia panel. The Lumenzia panel actually specify that their masks are in 16-bit, uh, which is quite an improvement because whenever you um, start blurring masks and using levels and whatever on masks, um, they are as susceptible to artifacts and to fringing as images are. Actually, the comment here from Candy uh, saying several filters in Photoshop don't actually work in 16-bit, or have they fixed that now? Um, I'm certainly not aware of any filters that I can't use in Photoshop, and mine, I'm always using 16-bit. That's interesting, because David... So there there may be on. some setting there that on her computer that she needs to tweak. It'll be under preferences, I would have thought, um, but it may be worthwhile Googling that but I'm not aware of any filters that I cannot use and I'm always working in 16-bit. It's interesting, actually, David said the same thing. So maybe there are some settings that need tweaking. Um, question from Heather, would a JPEG come through as 16-bit uh, from Lightroom, please? 
Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me just check. Um, I, do, I actually, I'm not sure even if JPEGs are um, 16 bit. I don't think they are, are they? I think, I right. think JPEGs are eight bit. Um, yeah. So I don't think that that is. Uh, yeah, well, work and raw is the advice. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Actually, the comment from David here who asked one of the earlier questions, I think it's his image, you have to change the mode to choose 16-bit in Photoshop. So maybe it's, it is a setting you've got to set in the first place, perhaps. Uh, okay, question from Peter. Actually, there's a few more questions coming in now. Are you still okay for time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Question from Peter. Do you use Lightroom to do your first editing? Um, and is ACR exactly the same as Lightroom? Yeah, they are essentially the same. They have a slightly different layout, but the tools will have the exact same effect. You know, if you're bringing up shadows or highlights or using the vignetting tool or whatever, they are exactly the same. So just the the, the interface is slightly different. Um, what was the start of the question on that? Um, Wish I deleted it so I can't. Oh, hang on. I can probably go back and look. Have a quick uh, oh yes, using Lightroom for yeah. Now, do you use Lightroom for your first edit? Uh, yeah. yeah. Do, do you use Lightroom for do your first editing? And is ACR exactly the same? Yeah. So I've answered the ACR, but the 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 reason I love Lightroom is because I'm typically working in a studio, and I would have maybe 10, 12 shots that are very very similar. The, the beauty of Lightroom is that they, they appear as a catalogue in front of me and I can say, oh, look there, that one is slightly better than that one. Uh, and I can pick the best one out of each sort of set. Whereas if you're just looking at thumbnails in a folder and dragging one into, a, into Camera Raw, you never really get a chance to see that in effect, the next one was slightly sharper or the next one was, you know, you're just sort of, I find you're just picking an image to edit um by pulling them out of a folder into camera raw whereas i say in lightroom i can actually look at them and compare them uh before i decide which one is the best one to edit so yeah i know always work from lightroom at the start uh there's a comment here actually further on about uh converting things from 16 bit to 8 bit they say when we submit any work for a salon we have to convert it into 8 bit then the extra information which is present in 8 bit will no longer be available uh, what's your thought on that um, well, as I say, I, I think JPEGs are 8 bits. So if I'm sending they off are. JPEGs, they yeah. are 8 bits. Um, so even my, I have an action to resize, you know, to different dimensions. Uh, for instance, the uh, typical competition uh, dimensions at the moment seem to be 1600 by 1200, but sometimes in foreign salons, they can be 1080 tall, et cetera, um, and, but can be up to 90, 20 wide. So I have different actions to resize, but in, included in the action um, is to convert my color space to sRGB because I work in pro photo color space. So my raw files and pictures that I'm editing in Lightroom and then Photoshop are in pro photo color space. And you do not want to send off a JPEG in any color space other than sRGB. Um, so my actions actually include changing it to sRGB, but there's no requirement for images to be 16-bit uh, or 8-bit. I've never seen that because I say, I'm fairly sure JPEGs are 8-bit. Um, they are only 8-bit. There's been several comments that have come through that uh, JPEG won't support 16-bit and it won't. I think it was around before 16-bit was thought of. <laughs> um, basic question from Peter, going on from actually what you were talking about, Profoto. He says, what are the advantages of using Profoto RGB rather than the straight RGB color space? Well, I suppose he means sRGB or Adobe RGB color space. Yeah, the easiest way to describe it is to say that if you use sRGB, your colors are in a bucket. If you use Adobe RGB, your colors are in about three or four buckets. And if you use Profoto, then your colors are in a tank. Um, so um, you can only change downwards. You can't. You can physically change an image that is in sRGB to Adobe and then to Profoto, but there's no advantage because the colors are not there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, it will, you know, you can physically do it, but it has no effect. But you can um, work the opposite way. But you know, you're throwing colors away by coming down from Profoto to Adobe and then down to sRGB. 
but um, by and large, I have to say, you do need to be a pixel people to spot a, a massive difference. Um, or certainly on a print, I will always print in Pro Photo. I basically want as many colors and variations and colors uh, available to me as I can possibly have. Okay. Well, that was the last question. So, uh, Ross, thanks again. Uh, many, many thanks indeed for everything today and answering all the questions. It's been a really interesting uh, afternoon. Uh, as I've said, we will be sending out uh, a follow-up email, and in that follow-up email will be the links to the discount codes and Ross's actions and everything else. So you'll get all that information shortly. So, Ross, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to see details of Ross's work, that's his website information that does come up on your screen now, so please go and have a look at that. So, Ross, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, RPS Digital Imaging is very glad that you joined us for this event. Thanks for coming along. Uh, this is Digital Imaging's 34th online event, and we now have many more in the pipeline. If you are not already a member, you will find that even though the fee for non-members is very low, if you are an RPS member already, you will find that you can probably save money by joining Digital Imaging as a digital-only member. Now, our next online event is called Infrared Artistry, Revisualizing Your World, and it's with Tony Sweet. That will be on Saturday, July the 30th, same time, same place. Uh, in, uh, so thanks for that. And in the meantime, everybody, stay safe and see you soon.